This is FRM Part 1, Book 3, Financial Markets and Products, Chapter 6, Hedging Strategies Using Futures Contracts. And of all of the derivative securities topics that I love to teach, showing students how to hedge, sometimes it's a perfect hedge, sometimes it's an imperfect hedge. Uh, these topics are among my favorites. So let's look at the learning objectives uh, quickly here. We're going to take a look at the difference between short and long hedges. We're going to argue for and against hedging, talk about basis risk. Of course, we always have to talk about basis risk. And then we're going to define cross hedging and the need for some kind of a hedge ratio. And as in lots of instances in finance, we're going to try to find the hedge ratio that has the minimum variance. Boy, coming up with some solution where that volatility, that standard deviation or the variance is pushed in a vice so it gets to be the smallest possible number. So we're going to call that the minimum variance hedge ratio. We'll talk about the optimal number of futures contracts, take a look at an example of a stock index futures contracts, and then uh, end with rolling the hedge. All right, let's go ahead and start with short versus long hedges. All right, a short hedge occurs when the trader shorts a futures contract to hedge against a price increase in the existing long position. So notice that first circle point, the trader already owns the underlying asset. So here's the deal. With hedging, you have to have a position in the spot market and you use the derivatives market to hedge. Take the example of a farmer. Let's suppose that we're considering a farmer who grows corn and wheat and sugar and cocoa and all that kind of good stuff, um, what's the best thing that could happen? The best thing that could happen to that farmer is to plant those crops and then have the price skyrocket by the time, by the, time the harvest comes in so then he or she can sell at that very, very high price, right? So the farmer is naturally short in the spot market. So in order to hedge, the, for, the farmer then must take the short position in the derivative contract, in the futures contract. And so this is what happens when you're doing this hedge. And this is true for both the short and the long hedge. You have that one position in the spot market and you take the opposite position in the futures market. Think about what that means. You're locking in a loss. You're guaranteeing that you're going to lose in one market but you're also guaranteeing that you're going to win in one market. I mean, the idea is that you don't know which market you're going to lose in. If you win in the spot market, you're going to lose in the futures market. If you lose in the spot market, you're going to win in the futures market. Now, the long hedge, of course, is just the opposite. This occurs when a trader buys a futures contract to hedge against a price increase in the existing short position. So the trader has a short position in the underlying asset. Take a, take a, a business like an airline company. What does an airline company do every day? Every day they buy gasoline or some kind of fuel for their airplanes, right? So what's the greatest thing that could happen? The greatest thing could happen is that they take their airplanes and they go into the sheets uh, or the Wawa or wherever, wherever airplanes go and they say, fill it up. And the dude says, oh, didn't you see the sign? Gasoline is free. Now, of course, that's the best thing. So, so the airlines, they are short. They're naturally short in the spot market. But what are they worried about? They're worried about a spike in prices. If the price of gasoline or oil or some kind of other energy goes way, way up, well, then they're going to have to pay that higher price. And then, of course, they'll have to uh, transfer those higher prices, uh, higher input prices into higher prices for their customers. So an airline, which is naturally short in the spot market, will take the long position in the futures market. Once again, guaranteeing a win or a loss in one of those two markets. But here's the, here's the sense. The reason that these large businesses enter short and long hedges is to lock in the future either selling price or that future input price. I mean, think about uh, an airline. What, what do they do? They don't really want to have to worry about the price of oil going up and down and up and down. They want to worry about getting people to come and sit in on their airplane so they can focus on their core business, just like a farmer. Farmer doesn't want to worry about the price of wheat going up and down. The farmer wants to do the planting and the weeding and the fertilizing 
and the harvesting and all that stuff that a farmer does. So these hedges allow these businesses to focus on their core business and to hedge, to reduce the volatility in those future cash flows. All right, some advantages and disadvantages. I probably talked about these, right? It helps asset holders to lock in a price for their assets. That makes sense. It helps prospective buyers like the airline to lock in a price of their goods they intend to purchase. Now, remember uh, what I said in the previous video, I think this might have been chapter four when we talked about the introduction. Whenever you use a forward contract or a futures contract, there's going to be a sense of regret or a sense of pride because you either paid too much or you paid too little. But again, again, that's one of the disadvantages, but it's worth that disadvantage so that the businesses can focus on their core expertise. So notice what I have here. Hedging might lock asset holders out of improving market prices, of course. Uh, and then the second one there, hedging is not necessarily beneficial to a company's shareholders. This goes all the way back. Remember those two guys in 1958, Franco Medigliani and Merton Miller? Um, of course, what do we know? We know that bondholders and shareholders are never going to pay executives high salaries to do something that, that the bondholders and the shareholders can do on their own. So investors can hedge themselves, so they might not need the firm to do some hedging. Ah, notice what I have there in the second point. Risk averse shareholders are assumed to hold diversify, diversified portfolios that mitigates those specific risks. Uh, comma, let's take a deep breath. Nevertheless, uh, hedging is done by businesses all over the place. How about basis risk? We talked about the basis in uh, previous chapter five as being the difference between the spot price or on this slide, I have cash price, the spot price and the futures price. So if we have a current spot price of gold of $1,500 and the six month futures price is $1,550, then the basis, the basis is $50. And so the basis risk is the scenario under which, and here, let me do it like this. So we've got a $50 difference between those two prices. I mean, what's going to tend to happen to that $50 over time? I mean, it could be like this. It could be up because prices are going to rise and prices are going to fall, right? Does that make sense? But what happens if that $50 all of a sudden becomes $75 or if it becomes just $25? This is basis risk. And the problem with basis risk is that it makes the hedges less effective. Remember I said earlier that it's possible to have a perfect hedge. I and mean, there are lots and lots of factors that have to go into this for a perfect hedge. But basis risk... Uh, might eliminate the possibility of, uh, of a perfect hedge. How about sources of basis, basis risk? All right, so first of all, we're going to have um, a scenario under which the underlying asset doesn't match the asset in the futures market, right? So let's, there's an example there. We're going to hedge jet fuel, jet fuel with a motor vehicle fuel futures contract. How about changes in the component costs of carry? Remember, if I'm, the, if I'm the oil guy and I have a barrel of oil and I'm willing to sell it to you for a certain price today and you say, wait a minute, Jim, I don't need it for three or six months and I'm going to charge you probably a higher price. Well, basis risk means that you know maybe I'm going to charge you $8 to store this over, over a six-month period. But during that six-month period, maybe the cost of storage goes up to $10 or maybe it falls to $6. So that can increase the basis risk. Uh, maturity mismatch. Remember, remember that the that the futures contracts are all standardized, and so they typically they typically mature on the third Friday or the third Wednesday of the month. Although that's kind of been changing over the last year or so, but typically, you know, it's a one day in June. Well, suppose that you're harvesting on on June first, and the contract doesn't uh, uh, mature until June twentieth. Ah, there's going to be basis in there because there's not going to be that complete convergence in prices that we talked about back in the previous chapter. Uh, and then there's the possibility that you're going to hedge with um, maybe the New York Mercantile Exchange um, and then maybe with the London International Financial Futures and Options Exchange, maybe there's differences in prices. Maybe you're going to look at the spot price in New York and the futures price in London. Uh, either way, these are four good sources of basis risk to remember. 
Now notice my, my final arrow point down there. To minimize basis risk, it's imperative to choose the edging tool that's most correlated with the underlying asset. Oh my gosh, that's so important. All right, let's talk about cross hedging and then we'll lead right into correlations. Here's the example that I give my students all the time. Let's suppose you're a farmer and you grow corn and you show up on an organized exchange and you say, hey, look, I'm going to harvest all this corn in three months. I would like to lock into my future selling price of corn. Do you have anything that will uh, serve that purpose? And of course, the exchange will come along and they'll say, oh, yeah, hey, Jim, right here is a corn futures contract. And you look at yourself and you say, hey, that that sounds awesome. I have corn in the spot market and there's a corn in the futures market. So I can arrange that to get almost a perfect hedge. But let's suppose that you're a farmer and you grow strawberries and you show up on the uh, organized exchange and you say, I have a strawberry harvest coming up in three months. Do you have anything to hedge? And the people on the exchange are going to look around and they're going to say, boy, I, I, we don't have a strawberry futures contract, but come over here. We have a gasoline futures contract. <laughs> and over here we have a gold futures contract. And over here we have an S&P 500 index futures contract. And you're going to scratch your head. You're going to say, wait a minute. Uh, wait a minute. Strawberries and gold, that doesn't make any sense. I'm not going to hedge using uh, a contract on an underlying asset that has no relationship to what uh, it looks like on my farm. But then maybe somebody from the exchange will say, oh, oh, wait a minute, didn't I hear over in the back room we're going to use and start trading a blueberry futures contract? And now you might say, oh, my gosh, strawberries and blueberries. Well, why are you attracted to the blueberry con uh, contract? Notice what I have in that first circle point there. Ah, what you're looking for are derivative securities that have high correlations to your underlying strawberry asset. So if strawberry prices and blueberry futures contract prices are highly correlated, like 0.9 or 0.95, then you can reasonably cross hedge. Look at the final block point. The assets are not entirely identical, but there, are enough, there must be enough correlation for the hedge to work. I mean, what do you think the correlation coefficient between strawberries and gold is? You know, it's probably zero, right? So we're going to find a contract that is close to it. And of course, as good financial risk managers, we can't just look at something and say, oh, oh, that's probably close. No, no, we're going to we're going to put on our gloves and we're going to get out our statisticians tools and we're going to calculate correlations to make certain that this cross hedge is going to work. Now, what that means is that we've got to come up with some kind of a hedge ratio. And there's a good formula there in the middle. That rho sub SF is the correlation coefficient between spot prices and futures prices. And let's just quickly use the example of corn. Let's suppose that we're, we're corn farmers and there's a corn futures contract, right? What's that correlation going to be between corn, spot corn, and futures corn? Well, it's probably not going to be one, but it's going to be pretty close to one, right? And then notice what's the standard deviation of the spot and what's the standard deviation of the future? Well, they're probably not going to be identical standard deviations. But if one is 13.2%, the other one's going to be 13.1% or something very close. So that hedge ratio, when we have corn in the spot and corn in the future, is going to be about one. That just simply means that, oh, whatever the standardized contract is, we'll just take one of them. But if we're doing strawberries and blueberries, the correlation might be 0.9 or 0.85, and the standard deviations might be 17% and 13%. So notice what that hedge ratio means. It takes, the, it takes the correlation coefficient between the spot prices and the futures prices, and then it adjusts them by the ratio of their two risk levels. Remember, standard deviation measures total risk. And you always put, remember this for formulas, if you ever have to do this on an exam, remember, uh, spot always goes in the numerator, spot divided by futures. Now, of course, uh, I probably should remind you about stuff that we did in previous chapters. There's a good definition for 
correlation coefficient. Remember, it's a standardized covariance. So we take the covariance between the spot and the future, divide by the two, the product of the two standard deviations. Remember, I said this to you at one point, covariance could be almost any term, but the correlation coefficient is a standardized covariance. So it's going to be uh, somewhere and including a minus one to a positive one. And then you can rearrange these kinds of formulas to get all the way out to beta. So the effectiveness of a hedge me measure has to be determined based on the amount of variance, the amount of standard deviation, the amount of volatility that's reduced by implementing the optimal hedge ratio. I mean, we could come up with Jim's hedge ratio. Let me go back here. Jim's hedge ratio could be something like, uh, oh, the length of my house times the number of raindrops that fell during the rainstorm yesterday. That's Jim's hedge ratio. And you guys should be scratching your head saying, well, Jim's hedge ratio, that stinks. That's not going to work. This optimal hedge ratio, this makes perfect sense. Now, one of the ways to determine whether the variance is being reduced to its optimal level is by uh, doing some kind of statistical analysis. You can do linear regressions. You can do correlations and coefficients. But essentially what you're going to do is compute the R square. Remember R square is a measure of the ability of one variable to explain the ability, I'm sorry, the variability in one variable to explain the variability in another variable. So R squared. So we're looking for high R squares in other words. Here's a good formula for the number of futures contracts that are needed to hedge. So that N over on the left hand side of the equal sign stands for the number of futures contracts. And this is going to be for a complete hedge. What we're going to do is uh, take the beta of the portfolio and multiply it by the portfolio value divided by the value of the futures contract. And remember, there might be a multiplier for an S&P 500 or some kind of a stock index futures uh, contract. Now, what happens is that we compute the number of futures contracts today, and this might be over, like, let's say, a three month window and things change over the next three months. And so what we might want to do is trail the hedge. And so we might have to adjust the number of futures contracts by current up to date data on spot price and futures price movements. That's called trailing the hedge. So let's go ahead and decide how to change a stock portfolio's beta. This is specific to the learning objective uh, that we talked about on that very first slide. Now, we, we should remember that beta is defined as the measure of a portfolio's systematic risk. Remember how I define systematic risk. It's the variability in asset returns due to changes in economic factors, things like GDP, things like employment, things like uh, oil prices, things like foreign wars, things like uh, President Trump's tariff policy. Sometimes that's up, sometimes that's down. That's all part of systematic risk. Now, let's suppose that we have this portfolio. We've got this massive portfolio. Suppose we're a money market manager and we have $100 million uh, that we're managing. Notice that we're long, right? We buy all these shares of stock, we're long. We benefit when the prices rise. But what do we know? We know prices go up and prices go down. Let's suppose that we're very concerned of a short-term drop in asset prices, a short-term drop in stock prices. Well, if we take this to an extreme level and we're very afraid of a short-term fall in stock prices, what we could do is just sell all the assets in the portfolio and put them into a money market mutual fund. But remember, we're not getting paid to do all that stuff because our shareholders, our investors, they can do that on their own. They're relying on us as good financial risk managers to manage the risk, to manage the volatility. So what we can do is we can use an index futures contract to hedge that portfolio and reduce the number of losses, reduce the size of the losses if, in fact, stock prices fall. All right, so here's the scenario. Let's suppose that we have this portfolio and what we want to do is reduce our beta. We want to reduce our beta from some number down to some smaller number. Now, what you could say to me, you could say, well, wait a minute, Jim, why don't I just sell my high beta portfolio stocks and buy lower beta portfolio stocks? 
And that's a reasonable question. In fact, some money managers will actually go ahead and do that. But that's only going to occur if, in fact, the client or the investor or the shareholder's risk and return objectives have changed. Plus, you have to pay uh, bid and ask spreads. There's probably going to be some tax implications. Uh, and all sorts of bad stuff can happen when you do this, when you buy and sell for reasons of hedging. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a futures contract to hedge. And there's a good formula there. We're going to take the target beta and subtract that from the beta of the portfolio and then adjust it by the difference between the portfolio value and the value of the futures contract. All right. Now, that might look like a little bit of a strange formula there, but let me give you an example. Let's suppose we're a portfolio manager. $200 million worth of tech stocks has a beta of 1.5 relative to the NASDAQ 100 index. All right, current value of the index is 2,500. And the multiplier, the standardization in this uh, NASDAQ futures contract is 300. All right, here we go. Second circle point. Over the next three months, uh, Rachel Zane wants to use the NASDAQ futures to reduce the systematic risk of the portfolio to one. Now, why would she do this? This is because she is concerned, very concerned, that uh, over the next three months, the NASDAQ 100 index is going to fall substantially. So she's going to take the short position in the futures contract so that if in fact, if in fact the price falls, prices fall, then the value of the portfolio will not fall by as much. We're hedging. All right, so here's the solution here. Uh, target beta is one. Portfolio beta is 1.5. So we take the difference of those two. We multiply that by $200 million worth of our portfolio. And then we multiply the uh, index, the futures price of 2,500 times the multiplier of 300. That gets me 133 contracts. And there's a minus sign there indicating that uh, we're going to short the contract. Now, I really wish, I really wish, and you guys don't wish this at all, but I really wish that the learning objective would say something like explain, explain using uh, stock index futures contracts to reduce a portfolio's beta, comma, and show the results or calculate the profit or loss. And so let me just quickly tell you what's going to happen here. So look at this. What happens? We're shorting the futures contract. So Rachel's portfolio is worth 200. So let's suppose that the NASDAQ 100, it crashes and she loses $50 million. So the value of her portfolio goes down to $50 million. But because she had the short position in this index futures contract, maybe she got back, let's just say 25 million, you know, I'm making these numbers up. So her portfolio value is 200 minus the 50 gets her down to 150. But she made 25 million in the futures market. So her portfolio value, which used to be 200, it could have been 150 without the futures contract is now 175 with the futures contract. Do you see how hedging works? That's cool stuff. Now, of course, what did Rachel do in that previous example? It was a three month hedge. So what happens if after three months she's still saying, oh, my gosh, I'm still worried. I'm still worried that uh, that the Nasdaq 100 is going to continue to fall or is going to fall. Well, what we're going to do is, uh, what she's going to do is she's just going to roll her hedge. And so we're going to replace expiring futures contracts by obtaining new futures contracts. And so the only thing different then is with a different maturity date. So she's probably going to replace a three month with a three month. Unless, ready? Unless she thinks the prices might fall for another six months. So then she may do it with a six month. And that takes us through these learning objectives. Next up, we'll talk about interest rates.